the sage, the wise woman, and the voice of reason. This is Leah C4. We all need someone in our lives who says it like it is. And in this episode of the reInvent podcast, Leah speaks about how far down the rabbit hole we need to go before realizing that our lives have to change. On today's podcast, I have with me Leah C4 yet again, and today what we're going to talk about is the level of pain we have to reach in order to make big changes in our lives. Oh, that's a very big one. It's a big one, and it's I think you, you and me equally see it across both our fields. Is yes. People will wait for worst case scenario before they're willing to change their behavior. So the psychology is really interesting, this behavior. And I, and I think this is, you know, if somebody had again solved this, they would, they would be multimillionaires because this is the underpinning thing behind changing behavior is that we, we really take stuff for granted every day and we don't think there's a problem. And these little hints, these tiny little red flags, these little moments, and we, we just become so used to brushing stuff under the carpet and, ah, oh, tomorrow's another day and it'll be fine. And, and we, we justify a lot of stuff. Oh, it's just a bad day. It's just a once-off. Oh, that pain that I'm feeling, I haven't felt it before. It's probably just because I'm stressed. We kind of justify a lot of things in our body and in our minds and in our relationships. Um, and the ignoring of those red flags is detrimental because... Everybody who's gone through a crash, anyone who's gone through a really debilitating illness, anyone who's had a relationship end, you know, you name the collapse, anyone who's gone through it will always look back and go, aha, Mm -hmm. that's the warning signs. There was stuff already going on for months or years before. I just wasn't paying attention. So So why do we you know just not deal with stuff? Why are we taught to make this lump under the carpet so big? that it fills the room before we take action. Where in, is that a, is it a case of survival? Is it just the way humanity is taught to deal with things? Why aren't we taught from a young age to address discomfort? Mm, that's a really good question. You know, I, I think that, that, that the kind of happy way of looking at life that parents want to instill in their children, yes, but, oh, I know you're having a bad day, but tomorrow will be another day, you know. I know that your friend fought with you, but you know there's lots more other friends that you can make. Um, I know that you hurt yourself today in your sport, but, you know, you'll recover quickly. We do so much of the but and then add the positive after um, that we always completely diminish the reality of where the person is and we've become fearful of negative emotion and I don't know where that you know comes from um, but it's something we have to consciously work to start shifting in our own lives and with our kids because negative emotions healthy in certain circumstances and dismissing that teaches kids well okay obviously what I'm feeling isn't real or valid so I need to just you know brush over it and be happy And happiness seems to be the goal for people. And I've never understood that. I really haven't. Uh, It's it's such a dismissiveness of everything else that isn't. That's not all there is. No, it's not all there is. And it's, it's, you know, what I call spiritual bypassing is that you're not looking at the real stuff. You're convincing yourself that everything is wonderful because your home looks nice, because, you know, your relationship seems fine on social media, because you do your meditation every day and you do your yoga class all the time and you're doing the work. And yet you're not addressing the real stuff that's going on. So you convince yourself you're in the happiness and in the light and in the joy. Um, But, you know, at night when you close your eyes and go to bed, it's just you and yourself. And you have to face the things that you said in the day, the things that you did in the day, the things that you know you should have been doing that you're not doing. And at the end of the day, you are the only one that can hold yourself accountable. So yeah, how how thick is a coat of varnish? And I think that's what we, we, we gloss pardon the puns, over our lives with this this veneer. But that's what it is. It's a semblance of pseudo-happiness, pseudo-reality. We're not getting to the issues. And and also like this weird spectrum we have of what we are allowed to collapse over. In other words, there's a spectrum of, of bad life things that can happen to us. And some stuff it's like, oh, well, you must just get over that. But other things like, oh, okay, no, that's bad enough for you to need a day of work. That's bad enough for you to, to, to be in the bad mood that you're in. So we've got to get rid of the spectrum because when it, whenever I'm in a moment that something is not okay with me, I don't care whether it, it's, you think it's big or small. For me, it's not okay. Mm-hmm. And you've got to sit with where that person is at and work with them in their view of what's going on. And we do this a lot as parents, and you know me, I'm always going to go back to our grounding beliefs, which are set in childhood, which dictate a huge amount of our adult behavior. And we do this a lot with kids. We do it because we don't want them in the pain, of course. 
We do it because we don't want them to be upset. We want to just move them out of that place as quickly as possible by painting the happy picture. And some parents, and I'm sure this is what plays a huge role with you in your field, use food to get children out of negative emotion. Yep. Oh, you've had a bad day. Let's go get an ice cream. Oh, my darling, you're not feeling so well. Here's a nice chocolate. A lot of parents choose to soothe their children's pain with food. And I think with you um, in your field, this is what you're battling with is soothing and food being a comfort, um, which which gets them to avoid the real the danger, issues. the real health issues until they get the tumor or the cancer or the heart condition or the diabetes. But very often these parents are soothing themselves with food and yeah. alcohol. So yeah. it's I'm gonna it works for me. I'm going to just this is genetic. Um, patterning. This is genetic passing down the genes in our behavior more than yeah. what we inherit in the genome. You know, the genome is only 3% hardwired. Everything else is yeah. very much within your control. Yeah. And it's our habits that we've learned from our parents that we pass forward to our children. And our bad habits, I don't want to say bad because it's unresourceful, mm-hmm. that we, we teach our kids to self self-soothe with mm-hmm. sugar. Mm-hmm. And because we're doing it ourselves, they won't do it if we don't. You've got to be conscious of what you're doing. You've got to be, and but most people aren't. You yeah. know, most people are just unconscious. And I think that's the two things for me is number one, the total unconsciousness of people paying real attention to what's going on, so that things have to get extremely bad before people will take notice. But the other thing is that we do not live in a world with instant manifestation. So it's not like we eat the sugar and like right now I get the diabetes, you know, because if that's the case, things would be a bit different. It's it's not like, well, I had one fight with my husband and now we're getting a divorce, you know. So it is the prog- the progression of bad behaviors. The slow boil. The slow boil. And it is the big issue is why we let things go so far is because in the process until the day of diagnosis or the day of divorce or the, you know, the day of being fired or whatever the situation is. We really don't think that there are real consequences for what we're doing. Mm. We, we don't find. see the build-up. We don't. Mm. And we, we, we oh, it's just one piece of chocolate cake. Oh, yeah, I know it's been a week. You know, I'll start the diet on Monday. You know, I think the most spoken sentence on planet Earth, I'm yes. going to start on Monday, you know. Um, and then we think, you know, it's been a week and I'm not noticing any problems in my body. I've been eating crap all week. I'm sleeping fine still and I'm okay and I don't have pain in my body. You know that that nutritionist, you know, she's so dramatic. You know, there's really nothing wrong with me. Um, or, or I see it with my couples that I work with, you know, yeah, we, we, yeah you, we've been for a week. Things are fine. We, we saw, saw you once. We've done a few changes and things are fine so we don't need to see you again. Big mistake. It is a huge mistake because, you know, prevention should be your total focus but it's people seem to have this limited resources to where they're going to allow their focus to be on a daily basis and and preventing the problem that they don't see there it's not one of them i think we're also looking for this miracle cure so just like we don't see the accumulation of bad habits become disease or become obesity Mm -hmm. when we make good changes we see a therapist we eat better Mm -hmm. we're expecting instant results and when we don't get them we default back Mm -hmm. to that unresourceful behavior that just kept us in a state of comfortable discomfort for so long what does it in your experience seeing clients where do they have to be to um where's rock bottom for a lot of people what is that breaking point where they have no more options in my practice, it is obviously divorce is a big one. Uh, loss of job and money is a big one. Um, and uh, family rifts. So uh, drama happens in a family and, and family just cut each other out and stop speaking to each other. So I think when people are in a place where they feel they've got nowhere to go, they don't have the finances to get themselves out of where they are. They don't have family or friendship support to get them out of where they are. Um, A lot of that rock bottom stuff, especially for women after a divorce where the man has been the provider and the breadwinner and they have not worked for 20 years. They don't know the job market. They don't know what their skills are. They don't know, you know, what their purpose is. Um, And it it, it erodes you down to actually questioning what value you have in the world anymore, you know, when you don't know what your purpose is and what drives you. So I think a, a big thing is when people put so much power in situations outside of themselves, this job makes me feel safe. My husband makes me feel safe. Um, my nutritionist is going to hold me accountable. My personal trainer is going to make sure that I've got the body that I want. Like we dump this responsibility totally outside of ourselves all the time to make us feel okay. And then the minute that stuff doesn't work, like I can't afford to see my nutritionist anymore. My personal trainer stopped doing his job. Um, they're downsizing at work. We are, we are then in a collapse because the power in our life was never coming from us. It was always coming from outside of ourselves. It is so true. It's... It's, I think you know you've hit rock bottom when you start taking ownership again. 
when you stop outsourcing your your muscles to the gym yeah. and pick up some weights at home yeah. and do some push-ups when you yeah. brush your teeth. Yeah. You know, that's I think for a lot of people where they go, okay, I have no more options. Mm-hmm. It's almost when we're out of choices. Mm-hmm. So I think we we're living in a in a society in a situation where people only come and see people like you and I. Mm-hmm when they've run out of options. Um, but then they hand the power over to you and me as well. Like, oh, no, I don't let them me. do that. They're going to get a, try. a big snot club from me if they try Good. and do that. Because Good. I know that. I'm, I'm not your crutch. I am not going to be here to hold this for you. I'm here to really show you how to hold this for yourself. And people just need a boost in their self-confidence and a boost in their self-esteem to know that they can. If they've been in an abusive relationship, if they've been in a workplace environment where their boss has been a total bully, you know, if they um, are being shamed because of the size of their body or feeling like they've got no control impulse control when it comes to the way that they eat it all boils down to a lack of self-esteem and a lack of self-confidence and a lack of self-respect so i think in any work i do that's my main focus is let me see how i can support you building that within yourself because if you know you can you will but it's knowing that you can it's a problem so if I can support people building up the, the confidence in themselves to know, you know, I'm in a, a crappy place right now, but I also know that I have amazing stuff that I can give and that I can do, and I have an ability to learn really fast, and I can be really creative in finding a solution for myself, and now I'm going to go and do it. Mm-hmm. So that underlies a lot of that is, is the lack of confidence that people have. Yeah, I'm also seeing um, many people, and I'm going to do another podcast on this subject, is People like to um, share what they're going through. And there's a lot of people, other people in our lives, who for whatever reason like to see friends and family members fail. They want to see them not succeed on that diet. Mm. Or they they love the fact that there's drama going on in the relationship. And choosing your team, your support team, is critically important Mm. to changing habits and behaviors. Otherwise, you you simply get stuck back in that 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 net it's like a fishing net mm-hmm. with all, all these these sloppy attitudes flapping around you and that doesn't support you and we default back to old behavior you know how difficult is it or easy is it to get one to really look at what's going on around them cleverly look i think that people compartmentalize a little bit too much now i know the last time we spoke i said one of the ways to deal with anxiety and stress is to compartmentalize and just be able to deal with one area of your life at a time but for the sake of today's conversation i'm going to say that that's an unworkable behavior um, because we, we, we deal with it in pockets. It's like I can come and work with my husband uh, in regards to our relationship in a coaching session, but outside of that, I'm not really actually going to do the work I need to do. Um, so I'll save all my fights and I'll save all my pissed offness and I'll save all my issues to come and dump it in the coaching session. Instead of actually using the tools you're giving me to sit and have a workable conversation with my partner about what's not working. So, you know, it's, look, I think that, I think you find this as well, is that we know that the brain is always hardwired to follow the path of least resistance. And your brain does not like putting in extra work for stuff. It wants to get the result and wants to get it as quickly as possible. And what people look for is just like a flat line or a calm or like a peace. And if it means I've just got to avoid the reality of what's going on to have that calm or peace, it's delusional, but that's what people think. I'm not going to fight with my husband. I'll just check out of this conversation because I'll rather have the peace. In the- so the brain wants to find that result, least amount of uh, uh, effort possible. So it's not going to bother going to all the exercises and all the tools and putting into practice all the stuff that they've read and learned and watched on that YouTube video. It's just too much effort. And we, we unfortunately are living in a world where people's ability to commit long-term to stuff is getting less and less and less our concentration is getting less and less our ability to focus is getting less and less and that really is complete social media stuff Mm. our attention span is shocking there's too much vying for our attention too much Mm. so now everything's vying for our attention now our husband's vying for our attention or now our body's vying for our attention we know this from habits when it comes to putting new behaviors in place it's effort and it's struggle in the beginning and we've got to kind of almost fight our hardwired brain to create new pathways to get different results so I think that the waiting for it to get so painful for a lot of people is that they actually don't have the energy to create the new pathways until they actually have no other choice so when the collapse happens you're in a part you're in a place of 
realizing, okay, I actually don't, I can't continue this path. I have to do something else. We see it time and time again. I don't know that it's something that's ever going to change because to be honest, and I know this because I experienced this in my own life, to put new behaviors in place on days when I'm busy and I'm stressed and I've got other things to focus on and work is really hectic and I've got to focus on my child and, you know, focusing on the salad I need to make for lunch because I know it's healthy. I just don't have it in me. So I'm going to totally default to like the slice of bread with jam, you know, and that's always been, you know, my battle with my life and my body is that I can never get into that committed place with my eating. I'm slack that way. Um, you know, I can totally do it in my work and I can totally do it with all of my um, my mental stuff and my emotional stuff and my spiritual stuff. But I, this has always been a path that I myself battle with. Uh, you know, I never have really gotten to that place of the collapse where it's gotten so painful I have to do something else. But I, I you know, even though I do this work for a living, <laughs> I battle myself with There's this. There's no therapist who gets it right all the time. We're no. all human. No. And I think that just makes us yeah. better at what we do because yeah. we understand from a place of empathy. Yeah. What I'm finding as well is not to try to fix everything. So if you know that, that is the one place in your life where you just fall down, don't try to fix it yourself. Get yeah. some help. Get someone to help you chop up some veggies and make sure the hummus is in the fridge so that it's there, that we can grab that. So don't, don't do it yourself because you've got so much to do. You can't be superwoman. You do have so much to do, but I'm also going to say that a lot of people are wasting huge amounts of that their time true. on endless social media scrolling. And, you know, if you just took an hour, just look at just, you know, you get apps on your phone that show you which apps you have used the most time on your phone. Because you think you're only on Facebook or Instagram for like 10 minutes. And actually, it's been 45. And it's mindless scrolling. I want you to look at how many posts you are actually actively engaging with that are adding value to your life. Or you're just being a voyeur and you are just observing and scrolling. And what could you actually be doing with that 45 minutes? It really takes 20 minutes to go into the kitchen and prep your food. It takes probably, if you could commit an hour and a half to batch cook meals for the whole week, it's really not that hard. So it's also a matter of what you're prioritizing. Um, I don't buy into this thing that all of us are so beyond stress seven days a week. We're stressed when we work, absolutely. And week time is hectic, especially if you're a parent and there's a lot on the go and there's extra meals in the afternoon and there's family commitments and I get that. But I'm sorry, Saturdays and Sundays, people can absolutely find the time to just commit to themselves for one hour or two hours to doing their journaling, to reading a chapter from an empowering book, to doing their food prep for the week, to watching a YouTube video that's going to give them some uh, tools to help them change the way they communicate in their relationship. You know, I don't know what the issue is, but I promise you there are free resources online to help you with that issue. There are millions, millions. of free resources. And I don't care what we're talking about. Diet, uh, exercise, uh, coaching, you name it, they're going to be free resources. Yeah, and you know, I think if you take the time and you get strict about it and make sure that you have some hour in the weekend where mm -hmm. you are resourcing yourself, the neurological feedback you get, the reward mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. or the reward feedback in the mm -hmm. brain starts building new behaviors because mm -hmm. you feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, it might not feel like having a glass of wine, that mm -hmm. kind of relaxation, but you will feel like you're empowering yourself. And not only that, but when you're in it, you cannot see it. So when you have the uh, an agreement with your family that Sundays is tech free day and you all lock your phones away and you actually have a day of engaging and being out and go and sit in the garden and go for a walk or go and do a park run or I don't care what you do, when you when you have a day where you actually just for an hour are stepping out of the chaos that you've been in, it allows you to reflect and it allows you to think of oh okay I'm I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm feeling great right now I need to manage this a little bit better so we need that objective view which which we have to get support doing you know getting yes. ourselves out of that space yes and I think this is a fantastic opportunity for a bit of a, a social experiment here so if anyone's listening to this is to try this out and let us know there is a facility on on anchor who hosts the podcast to leave a voice message if you want to or just email um, I'll, I'll leave some details in the show notes your experience with what happened when you went tech free as a family or just by yourself and decided to segment some time for yourself what happened mentally yeah what happened what did you get what did you realize so you know for for relationship stuff or for life stuff it is pulling yourself out of the environment where you are feeling the stress so that you can get a different perspective of that so if it means you are literally going to sit in the botanical gardens in your city for two hours with no phone to just sit and 
think about stuff, what are you realizing? If it's to do with your partner, and the two of you can maybe go together or you can go and book an Airbnb for one night in your city. You can literally book it the next block away. You don't have to go away for some whole weekend, but it's getting out of your home. It's getting away from your kids. It's getting out of the environment where the problem is so that you can look at it from a very different perspective. Um, and, you know, I don't know what you would suggest for eating or for food is not being so obsessed with getting it wrong it's finding you know just some fun around it and some enjoyment about it yes what's shifting with your mentality when you choose a different response dieting is a disaster in my opinion and i don't like to focus on what people do wrong i'd rather they made more effort about getting certain things right so one thing is the social circle if your friends enable your bad behavior you need to look for new friends yeah. or different friends or dilute that pool if you hang out with it's fine, if you hang out with um people who do trail runs on the weekend and make better nutritional choices you're going to be influenced by that so that's a good point that i want to bring up is that people like attention for particular reasons. Now, when we look at fundamental needs that drive our behavior, one of the biggest needs that we have is the need for connection, okay? The need for community, the need for belonging. And I do have to say that, unfortunately, people choose to engage negative behavior to get the attention. But, you know, you... you, you okay, let's just look at our news, for instance, you know. You, you're going to get the front page story for walking into a movie theater with an AK-47 and shooting up everybody. That's what gets the notice versus, you know, a retiree who's using her, her pension to feed 30 orphans a day. You know, I love that there's amazing good news sites, especially the hashtag I'm staying. And, you know, there's a lot of that bringing new, great new positive stories to light. But quite honestly, in our mainstream media, that page, that story of the lady with the orphans wouldn't make any news. So we've created a society where we get acknowledgement for negative behavior. Now, when you are in a problem or you, you're having trouble or you're going through a divorce or you've fallen on hard times, you get a huge amount of sympathy from the people around you. A lot of people feel sorry. A lot of people are terrible. They'll send messages. They want to check in with you. Are you okay? It is like that dopamine hit of getting the like on a Facebook post. It is the same trigger in our bodies of we are now the center of somebody's attention and we are being seen and we're being validated. This is where that hypochondria kicks in is that I get more attention for being a problem than I do for my life working for me. And a lot of family members have that person in the family that's always the problem, that's always broke, that always needs the bailout, you know, but hey, they get the attention. Nobody wants to hear that your relationship is fantastic, you know, (laughs) because when you go to a party and you say, oh, you know, I'm going through this terrible stuff, it allows everybody to now just dump and, and, and the energy focuses more on the problem than on the solution. So when you said, be careful of who you surround yourself with and who's supporting you, well, ask yourself what you're actually looking for from yes. your support system. Are they feeding you on some level? Totally feeding you. And are you looking to be fed for your victim story? Or are you looking to be fed by people who are holding you accountable and going, you know, stop eating crap. You know, and I've heard you moan about your husband now for six weeks in a row. And I'm sick of hearing about it. Like, go and do something about it. But this is amazingly where I see friendships and family relationships fall apart. Is when friends or family dare to try and hold you accountable. Well, you just don't understand me and you've got no sympathy for what I'm going through. And you just cut out the people who are actually the ones that are going to support you getting out of this place. So I'm sorry, but people do become addicted to their sad stories. They do become addicted to the sympathy attention that they get. And that's also why they'll stay in the bad behavior, which is ultimately going to lead to the great collapse. And to see yourself doing that and to admit it to yourself is virtually impossible. You know, we, we get stuck in these cycles. Uh, it's so, it's sad because it, it just keeps you stuck in this terrifying place of getting nowhere. I mean, I've got, I've got clients that I've seen for 12 years, 10 to 12 years, and the stories don't change because they need the story. It's part of the identity. It's, it's almost safe. It's, it's that uncomf- uncomfortable comfort zone. And sadly enough, the collapse will come But either that collapse can trigger you into a complete lifestyle change and to finding a new way, or the collapse is itself going to become part of the sad story. And it'll become a further thing for you to use as the weapon of why you don't need to show up in your own life. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, not everybody uses the ultimate collapse as a a springboard to something better. And the, the big question is, is there a specific kind of person with a specific kind of 
genetic makeup or family history that uses the opportunity to change versus the people who use the opportunity to say, well, there you go, I've just got bad luck. What is it? What is the difference? Because I believe we've all got that um, ability to use terrible circumstances as a kick in the ass. Mm. Uh, but that's where I was brought up. Mm. I don't know any different. Um, I know a lot of people who can't do that. You know, how do you get that, that, that push? Mm. I think we're all capable of it. What is it? Look, I think it's, it really comes down to shifting the context with which you view the world. So we all know the phrase, oh, you're seeing the, rose, the world through rose-tinted glasses. I want you to think about the lenses that you do view the world. Like, what is your general viewpoint of the world? Is it, is it all being done to you, or are you in the power seat to be able to make this, this change? When you think of your relationship, what's the general commentary that you have about your relationship? What is your story? That what you're is your yourself? story? Absolutely. Mm. What are you telling yourself about your weight, about the, your diet, about your parenting, about your financial situation? So that's a good starting point is actually do a written exercise. My story, my finances are in the state they are in because, and then write the story. My weight is the way that it is because, and then write the story. We cannot start shifting stuff until we are really clear about what our story is, our context that's keeping us stuck. When you now have the stories written out, I want you to kind of go through and highlight the sentences where it's all other people's fault. Uh, my finances are rubbish because the economy, because of the Guptas, because of the government, because of, you know, I don't know, what's your excuse? My relationship is in the state because he or she doesn't give me the attention I need. He or she doesn't care about me. He or she doesn't make the effort to spend time with me. My weight is in the state that is, oh, it's genetic. I'm sure you hear that a lot. I'm big boned oh, or like it's genetic. That. You know, that's why my weight is the way that it is. It's not anything to do with me. So write your stories for every area of your life, then take a highlight, and I want you to highlight all the sentences that are pointing fingers elsewhere and laying blame at someone else's feet. Now you will begin to realize why your life is not shifting, because you are just the victim in your own life and have got no control whatsoever. What I'd like you to do then is change the word they or them or you to the word I my finances are in the state because I, and see what starts to change with your context and your story, because nothing is going to change unless you start taking responsibility 100% for the state of your life. And the only way you're going to do that is starting sentences with the word I. Firstly, I think that's a brilliant workshop. That would be just the most incredible exercise in reality. And I always go back to kids because I'm, I have a child and I'm always thinking, how do we prevent our kids mm. from going through the same stuff? They're going to go through stuff. You mm. can't stop mm. that. And they have to because mm. that that's builds resilience. And for me, it's I want to protect her, but I also want to be, her to be a resilient human being. So I need her to bump her head. Mm. And the balance between that is terrifying. So I, this is such a good idea, even for young people, especially teenagers, who see the world through very smoky dark glasses very often is to write this all down and go my mom my dad my school my friends blah 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 and then get them to turn it to I. It's hard with teenagers and I'm going to tell you why. For any parent listening to this please do yourself a favor and buy a book called Inventing Ourselves by Sarah Jane Blakemore. She is a neuroscientist whose entire field of focus is the adolescent brain. It is a phenomenal book and unfortunately, we think that we can just change teenagers' behavior. It is a neurological, physiological change happening in their brains. And the, the, the example that she uses, which I absolutely love, is that she says, you know, we would never be mean to people with Alzheimer's and go, well, stop forgetting things and stop being so ridiculous and just pull yourself towards yourself. Alzheimer's is a condition. Their physical brain structure is changing. We would never attack them for that. It's no different with our teenagers. They're going through a structural change. And all we do is attack them for being stupid and being reckless and taking risk-taking behavior and not paying attention. So we also just need to get really realistic about what we can expect from our teenagers who are in this process of creating their social selves, their social selves, meaning, you know, how they're seen in the world. So nobody wants to see themselves as an asshole. You know, nobody wants to see themselves as being the problem. A teenager is not going to willingly sit there and go, yeah, you're right, it's all my fault. I didn't do my homework. I'm being rude to my parents. I didn't clean my room. Oh, there's always going to be an excuse. But with the teenage brain, they have the right to have those excuses. Yes. So the, the teenage, it's, it's hard with teenagers when we're talking about the theme of, of how far does it need to go 
Um, what, why do we have to go to that point of pain before the change will happen? I think any parent can relate to this. Something happens, it gets really out of control, you have a huge showdown with your teenager, they're terribly apologetic to you, they promise they're going to change their behavior, and a week later, you're right back to square one. And that's why I think people need to read that book is to understand mm. what's going on there. Yeah, that, that frontal cortex in the brain that is mm. there to keep you safe doesn't actually fully develop until the age of 25. Absolutely. And there are, I'm not sure which author coined the phrase, but he said that that age from through teenagehood right through to about the age of 24, 25 is the fourth trimester where you are there their frontal cortex and if you can remember that that you are still there to get them to think it's not up to them they're not emotional they're not mentally there yet but they think they are they and think that's they the are. warfare that's the warfare yeah. so look if you don't want the collapse of your relationship with your child you've got to pick your battles you know yeah. you've got to pick your battles you cannot be at war with them about everything and uh, so when it comes to teenagers, I think it's a bit of a different conversation around how we shift behavior because they literally have a different brain. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when we're speaking to adults, it's, it's you have to take responsibility. Otherwise, nothing in your life is going to change. And if you're going to go through life being committed to blaming everybody else, then you're going to hit that fall again and again and again. And this is what I, I, you know, I use a phrase in my work, which is called giving your power away. You're constantly giving your power away to other people. And what that means is that if you're pointing the finger and going, I'm in the state that I'm in because of them, who's got the power in that situation? It's not you. It's that other person or that institution or that situation. So you've literally given them the power to get you out of control. You've given them the power to affect your eating and your spending and your communications. You've got to stop that. So whatever's happened to you has happened to you. That cannot be changed. But where I sit today, I have the power to say, this is what I'm choosing for myself. I am 100% sorry, 100 responsible for every choice I'm making and for facing the consequences of those choices. It's tough. It's tough to realize you're the architect. I think it is tough, but it's tougher staying in a place where you just can't, mm -hmm. you're just not getting anywhere. Your options are going to run out. And that's why we have the amount of debt we have in this country. Mm -hmm. There's no real wealth. The amount of people driving around in cars that cost more than their homes and they don't own them mm -hmm. is astronomical mm -hmm. because it's how we how we perceive that we're seen in the world, not mm. you know, not taking responsibility for, you know what, I can't afford this. It's and being okay. vulnerable enough to admit that to people. So this whole nonsense of keeping up with the Joneses, you know, we've got to get over this. And the more, you know, this is why I love Brene Brown's work so much, because the more we can really get vulnerable about our true states, the more we know that and realize that all of us are in the same state. All of us are in that same place. So we've got to be able to say, where is the shame in saying, I don't have that kind of money. I'm not going to over debt myself to buy a car I can't afford. So why is that a shameful statement? Why is that embarrassing for people? That is so raw and it is so honest. And I honor that with people. I think it should be applauded when you yeah, go, absolutely. Out, I, I can't yeah. and I won't and I'm not going to put myself in that yeah. position. That is absolutely brilliant that you can just be that honest. Well, that's real. That's being real in the world. And, you know, that is the thing that underpins all my work is like, be real. Just mm. get real about your life and stop lying and pretending. Because if you're lying and you're setting a bar higher, then it makes your friends and family think that in order to connect with you, they need to hit that bar. Mm. And then it, it, it kind of escalates from that point. So, you know, this is, this is why I'm also loving... This is why I'm also... Uh, loving the millennials because th this is the first generation that I work with and that I see who are really not buying into this kind of social requirements, social constructs, social needs of, well, you leave school, then you go to varsity, then you leave varsity, then you get a job, then you get a relationship, then you get married, then you buy a house, then you get a mortgage, then you get a car. I mean, this ridiculous thing that we keep perpetuating, but millennials are not interested and I'm loving it. That I'm is. loving seeing that they're not doing this. They don't want to own homes. Most of them don't want to get married. They don't want to have children. They are hugely concerned about the state of the planet and their focus is elsewhere. So I think we stand a chance with them. I think we finally have a generation that are coming up that are not buying into this stuff. And, and this generation is conscious, let me tell you. I work with a lot of millennials and they are awesome mm -hmm. because they get it. They really get it, like real awareness in, in how they behave and how they speak and what they do. They're highly educated in terms of their self-education. So they research and they read books and they watch a lot of stuff and they inform themselves in a way that our generation and our parents' generation never did. 
So I say there is a bit of hope for the kind of consciousness shifting in humanity with this, these younger generations that are coming through. Um, but uh, it just requires daily focus and attention. And look at that. If you've got a young millennial who isn't worried about their mortgage because they don't have one, they're not worried about marital issues because they haven't gone down that path. They're not worried about parenting issues because they you know, don't have children. And I'm not saying that's the solution, but I'm saying it's a big reality. They have a far more mental resource to focus on themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people accuse millennials of being really selfish. You know, it's all about them. Well, yeah, it is. But look at what they are doing with that self-focused attention. They are shifting the general consciousness of their friends and then their communities and then their cities. It's really being felt and it's tangible. Um, and it's needed at this time because oh, we so cannot needed. carry on like no. this. No. So the planet in itself has come to the point of the collapse. The planet has been avoiding all the red flags for the longest time and it's coming to the collapse. So I think we are at an amazing time in this history of this world as we are witnessing like end time stuff of how the whole um, consciousness of humanity is starting to shift. Yeah. And it's going to change industry. And unless we're on top of that, or unless industry and, and marketing and media is on top of that, they're going to find themselves in, a, in an awkward position as well. And that brings kind of me to another point of what you're saying, is that no one is committing long-term anymore. You know, people don't want to commit long-term to a brand. They don't want to commit long-term to a relationship. They don't want to commit long-term to a job. And I see this in a very different way because a lot of people would look at that and go, you've got commitment issues. You've got no staying power. I'm like, no, 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 no. These, um, this generation and these kids are really paying attention to where I am now in the present moment. Is this working for me? Is this not working for me? <clears throat> if it is not working for me, it's really easy. I can make a different choice and move in a different direction. When we're talking about the theme of today, which is, you know, why does stuff have to get so bad before we'll do anything about it is because people have no boundaries and people stay committed to stuff far beyond the point that they should. People stay committed to a job far beyond a point where they should be there because it is just daily abuse and it's daily bullying and boundaries are not being respected, but you kind of give your time and you sell your soul for that monthly paycheck. People stay in relationships far beyond the point where they should. Because they refuse to accept that sometimes a relationship gets to a place where the two people in it have shifted so much in their own lives, they can no longer relate to each other. Yeah. And that's, again, that vulnerability. Own it and be real about it. And this is what I see with a lot of millennials. You know, it's, it's, they're in relationships and they're willing to work on it, but they're definitely not willing to compromise themselves for it. So they will apply stuff and they'll do the tools and they'll work with the communication and they'll shift their things. But you know, they're going to see me once a week. They're going to see me once a month and they're going to be really honest that we've given it our best shot. I've put everything into it. We are not resonating. This is not for either of us. And with great love and respect, goodbye. And I value that hugely versus someone who it's been 20 years. It's really clear that for the last 10, it hasn't worked. Why are you still here? Why are you forcing this? Because you made a contract or because you made a vow, but look at what it's costing you. Look yeah. at what it's costing you. And that is where people hit the pain. But I made a promise. So I've just got to keep doing this. And the know? construct of marriage, I mean, it was created so that you could share land rights and secure. It was for security reasons way back hundreds of years ago. It doesn't apply nowadays. You need a whole new podcast just for this conversation yes. of marriage. Because yes. it's one of my, my biggest workshops that I run is, a, is this thing about what is marriage really. And it's really interesting to look at. So... I think we have to have another conversation about that because that. it's such a big issue that I'm seeing. And I'm seeing it with couples even in their 40s mm -hmm. and their 50s. It's not necessarily just gen, um, sorry, millennials of really what, what is this thing anymore and why is it relevant? So I think that we always stick to what is safe and what is known. Of course. And that is why we will keep walking that path because but everybody else is doing it and it's like predictable and it's safe and it's known versus being willing to step out of the flow for a moment, step onto the river bank and go, well, is this really where I want to be swimming anymore? Do I still really want to be on this path and choose something different? So it's that, that changing context, getting a different view of your life. But for most people, look, I, you know, I know it's a really cheesy analogy, but I always use the GPS analogy. You've got to know where you are 
And you've got to know where you want to go to. The rest is up to the universe. You know, yeah. The rest is up to the universe. And people try and direct the flow of their lives a little bit too much. But what most people are not consciously aware of is where I am right now. What is not working for me in my life right now? Because your job might be amazing and it's fulfilling and it's inspiring and you get on with your colleagues and you have a fantastic time and you spend all your time there. That's nice and great and yay, I hope you have that for yourself. But is your relationship okay? Are your kids and you having an open, honest, clear relationship? How are your finances? What's going on with your parents and your siblings? Mm. You know, what self-growth work are you doing on your life? So, so let's compartmentalize that and get clear about what's not working. And it starts giving you an idea of what changes you need to start implementing. I see it very often with, with women, funnily enough, nowadays, who uh, are very successful in their careers and love their jobs, but everything else is falling apart. Yeah. Or they've got it together with the family. They're great moms, but they can't deal with their own emotional yeah. stuff. And everything else is falling apart. So we put everything into what's working and we create that, that mess with the rest of our lives. And something is going to go wrong. The body is so wise. In the cases I see, autoimmune is almost always back to an emotional stuckness that is years in the making. Everything, Nikki, every physical situation in your body relates back to stress. And that stress relates back to emotional stuff that hasn't been dealt with. All of it. Yeah. So your body is a huge communicator. It is speaking to you every day. So when you wake up in the morning, just do a check-in with yourself. How am I feeling in my body? Are there any aches? Are there any pains? Oh, that's new. That wasn't there yesterday. Maybe I need to go to my physio. Maybe I need to go and get a massage. Maybe I need to check with my GP because I've had that headache for quite a bit of time. And stop ignoring it. Stop ignoring it and stop swallowing it down with another McDonald's burger. And stop like drinking more wine to make the pain go away. Because then that's the collapse. And, and I'm sorry, but a lot of people are doing this with eyes wide open. I'm not going to say that most people are unconscious. You know you shouldn't be in that McDonald's drive through <laughs> So people do know what they're doing is not okay. Confirmation bias you is know. a terrible, terrible <laughs> affliction. We will find, you know, you, that's the problem with, with this access to information is we'll find an argument for or against yeah. anything yeah. and compellingly so. Yeah. But if it's not sitting well in your body and you're getting sick, that's the only answer you need. Um, and they're simple indicators. Are you sleeping? Are you waking up feeling refreshed after your sleep? How are you? How is your body and your bowels working every day? You know, let's. I'm sorry. Let's make this really simple here. Our body is a simple functioning mechanism. You know, what does your skin look like? You know, what are your energy levels through the day? That that for me is the huge indicator, which is why I always want when I work with people. Weirdly enough, when I work with people emotionally, and you know this because I send everyone to you, is that I I urge all of my clients to first go and get their hormone levels checked, get their neurochemicals checked, and get their eating checked. Because I know how much that stuff is going to make a massive difference in your life before you and me even start working together on the emotional and mental stuff. And if your hormones are out of control, no amount of coaching is going to resolve it. that. No. So please also get real about the fact you live in this physical body. It's got to be addressed. Your balance has to be found there first. Then the vessel is strong enough to start doing the emotional kind of transformation that's required. I see so many people who say, well, I want to do this naturally. Well, if nature had its way, it would be dead at 40 because once you can't <laughs> procreate, nature has no need for you. So, you know, and it's also very easy to um, badmouth medicine. That is absolute nonsense. Medicine is a miracle. It's misused in many places. Mm -hmm. You cannot take any pill that's going to fix a bad relationship or a bad diet or bad spending habits. There's nothing medicine can do about that. Um, but thank God for medicine when you're in an accident or you need your appendix Look, taken I think, out. exactly, I think there's any, you know, I, I get, you know, I'm one of the ones that only wants to ever go natural paths. I've got a big issue with allopathic medicine a lot of the time because of the misuse of it. Misuse. But I also know that there's times that it has literally saved my life. So balance is what is key here. But if you want to do things naturally, the most natural thing that you can do is sort your physical body out, sort your mental and emotional health out. That's natural to get yourself right before you start going into the pills and before you start going into the drugs. And if you're, you, you're taking medication for anxiety, why are you not changing the quality of your life that is creating the anxiety? You're not reducing your work hours. You are not taking care of your health. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not in a workable relationship, but you would rather take a pill to address the anxiety than deal with that stuff. And that's so, the problem I have with allopathic exactly. medicine. Is when you go to your doctor, 
They don't ask those questions. They just give you the pills. Uh, you know, it would be a different story if your doc said, okay, I'm giving you six pills. You have six days to get your shit together. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to go see a therapist. And I was like, I cannot un- enable this behavior anymore. That's responsible medicine. But that's functional doctors. That's why I'm that's really, really grateful for functional medicine because yeah. those doctors are that way and they're amazing and they check in with that stuff. You've got to right, make sure you've got the right medical team or the right healthcare team yes. around you. That's key. Um, and it, it really is key because they can also give conflicting advice. And then you don't know. It's like you said, you can read any article on the internet and you're going to find something that just fits your belief of what it should be. But, um, you know, just keep it simple. Make simple changes and pay attention to the red flags because they're there for a reason. Your body is designed to warn you when stuff is not okay. It's a brilliant system. I mean, do you ignore the tire pressure system yeah. bell in your car? Absolutely. No. But we ignore it in ourselves. Do you ignore the, oh, battery is on 7%, best charge it. You panic to find the charger yes. for your phone. Not panicking to find like a healthier meal to put through your mouth, yeah. you know. So we are a bunch of hypocrites, all of us, we really Absolutely. are. <laughs> we are useless in so many respects, but as long as we're trying. And it's a journey. I'm not going to lie. Like, if you really want to start shifting your perspective, that requires attention and focus and working with someone who can support you to find a different perspective. My experience, you know, when I I mentioned last, the the book that I'm working on is really looking at four different types of communication systems and four different types of people and how they behave in the world. Within those, there are definitely the ones that are radical disciplinarians with themselves. They will absolutely keep every agreement with themselves. They will follow a plan completely. They will deliver their work on time. They do exist. They are among us, people. <laughs> and and for them, it's 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 those are the aliens. Those that are the aliens. <laughs> But they, no, they, they're there. And, and yeah. for them, it's like, well, that makes sense. It's logical and it's practical. I understand it. I'm going to do it full stop. Whereas there's another system, which is all about the feeling and the emotion. But it doesn't make me feel nice to eat the kale. I need to have the chocolate because of how it makes me feel. And you're focusing too much on the feeling. And you're interpreting too much feeling from your boss at work and how he spoke to you. It's all the emotional stuff with that system. And in my experience, that particular one is the one that struggles with boundaries and struggles with new eating plans so yes there are different people that have the ability to switch their mind into focusing on a task in a very different way these discussions can go on for hours Uh and this was incredible thanks so again i'm going to put all of your details into the 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 bio the show notes Mm -hmm. uh both on the the anchor fm site as well as the reinvent site you do work remotely with people who are not Based in Joburg? Yes, I do Skype coaching. Do a lot of Skype Wonderful. coaching, and that can be booked through my website. So all sessions are booked online through my site. So you've got personal sessions, you've got workshops, you've got a book coming out, which is, I can't wait for that. <laughs> uh, so yes, let's talk again. And... Wonderful. Thank you so much for for coming in again today. This has been um, so much food for thought, as usual. Can't wait to see what what kind of feedback we get. And give it it to us, please. Like on any of our social media pages, write comments on this and get hold of us through our Instagram and through our Facebook and through, you know, our emails because we we do this for you guys who are listening. Um, And we really want to be talking about topics that are important for you. Yes. Um, so thanks for inviting me I love being here with you have a fabulous day yes you too and yes let's do this again this episode has been sponsored by Jackson's Whole Food Market if you would like to win a hamper full of delicious healthy products please go to the link in the show notes which can be found at reinventhealth.co.za forward slash podcast notes include your name and loyalty card number and stand a chance to win